The writer of Hebrews said that there remains a rest for the people of God. But what does that mean to rest? And in that context, who are the people of God? And why is it so hard for us to rest today? These are topics today on the Unsunday Show. You're listening to the Unsunday Show. Leaving behind religious obligation to find a more authentic expression of Christ in us, this is the Unsunday Show. Hey, before we get started, I want to give a shout out to my friend Joel Brzezinski over at the Growing in Grace podcast. He had me on his show. It's been quite a while now because I've been absent from this show for quite a while. But several months ago, he and I had a really good conversation that he recorded, and he put it on the Growing in Grace podcast as two episodes. So I want to give a shout out to Joel, just as we get started here, with a big thank you. And I will have a link to those two episodes in the description of this podcast. So having said that, let's turn to our topic at hand today, which is rest. Resting. I think as believers, we're not very good at resting. And I think part of the reason that we're not very good at resting is because of the religious environments that most of us have been in. Some of us have been seeped in that religious system for years and years. And in that system, you don't hear much about rest. What you do hear is a lot about obligation, a lot about conformity, a lot about doing more, but very little about rest. And that makes us not very good at resting. But remember, in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, Come unto me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, he said, and my burden is light. So, friends, if the yoke that you're bearing isn't easy, and the burden that you're under by religious obligation isn't light, then guess what? It isn't Jesus. I was reminded of this recently. We visited a uh, institutional church, and I hadn't been in an institutional church in years, but we visited this institutional setting, and much like I remember, it was mostly about obligation. It was mostly about conformity. One of the topics was convenience, and the whole idea, the whole thought that was presented was, if it's convenient, it can't be from the Lord. That the Christian life, or life inside the institutional setting, is hard and something that we have to push through to accomplish. And as the thought was being more fully developed, it became clear to me that the analogy of convenience was being used in opposition to conformity. In other words, you needed to be conforming to what was being said, to what was being expected of you. And if you weren't conforming to that, you were taking a convenient way out. You were looking for the easy road if you didn't conform to the rules and regulations. But you know, the cross delivered us from religious obligation, didn't it? But for some reason, we like to go back under that. We like to go back into that type of bondage, that religious bondage, of which Jesus died to deliver us from. And in saying that, let me say that there's nothing wrong with going to an organization like that, if that's what you want to do. But for me, it just struck me again as being unnecessary. Once you see through the fog, as it were, you can't unsee what you've seen. And what I've seen and what I've come to understand over the years is that in a religious institutional setting, there's been that additional layer laid on us of obligation, that additional layer laid on us of conformity, conformity to the rules, conformity to the expectation of others, particularly to the leadership. And conformity to the rules is assumed and it's equated with spiritual growth. But you know, growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus is a lot different than an institutional church's definition of spiritual growth. Because an institutional church's definition of spiritual growth consists of a higher commitment to what they tell you you need to be doing. In other words, in this particular instance, the emphasis was on service. We need you to be here serving, or we need you to be in one of the Bible studies that we offer and in so doing, you will grow. But those things have nothing to do with growing in grace. They have everything to do with growing the institutional setting. 
and through use of false guilt or demands of conformity to the rules, we get roped into doing these, this busy work, which is really what it is, and that does two things. It keeps the leadership off of our back, and perhaps it makes us feel better about ourselves because we're busy doing what we're told we need to be doing. But all of these things move us further away from the idea of rest. And of course, rest doesn't mean the absence of doing something, but it changes the motivation for doing something from obligation or guilt to the motivation of the new heart that you've been given, to the motivation of the Holy Spirit in you. And that's a big difference. The writer of Hebrews talked about rest a lot. It was one of his main topics, was the topic of rest. And the historical example that he used was Joshua. I talked about this in a a previous episode, and so I'm not going to rehash all of that. But just to set the context for you a little bit more, he's talking about Joshua leading the the Israelites, the children of Israel, into the promised land. And in that context, in that historical context, Joshua, being the leader, led them into the promised land. And two or three times in the book of Joshua, we're told that Joshua gave them rest, that they had rest on every side that they had rest from all of their enemies. And yet when you get to the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, no, 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 Joshua didn't give them rest. If Joshua had given them rest, there wouldn't have been another day spoken about later in the book of Psalms, where God is once again talking about his people resting. This is all in Hebrews chapter 4, if you want to take a look at it. And the contrast there in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3 says, we who have believed enter that rest. In other words, just the act of believing, belief, causes us to enter into that rest, that rest that was promised by God, that rest that Jesus mentioned that I talked about a few minutes ago in in the Gospel of Matthew. You know, come to me and I'll give you rest. How was that accomplished? Well, it's accomplished through belief. It's not accomplished through hard work. It's not accomplished through conformity. It's accomplished through belief. And because we believe, we've entered into that rest. And entering into that rest isn't something we did. It's a description of who we are, having believed. Having believed, we've entered into that rest. It was done to us. We didn't work it up. It wasn't through some religious act or some obligation to a religious institution that we get there. It's by faith alone. It's by belief in Jesus. And just like our sanctification is complete when we believe, so is our rest. We are, by definition, a people at rest. So what did the writer of Hebrews mean when he said there remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest for the people of God? Does he mean that there's some second level of resting that you and I have to achieve, that we have to strive after, that we have to get to, that's out there somewhere, but it's up to us to grab hold of it, to somehow make it ours, make it our own? No, it doesn't. Because remember, in the, in the letter to the Hebrews, The people of God spoken of is the nation of Israel. It's not the ecclesia. It's not the body of Christ. Remember, the writer of Hebrews is writing to Hebrews. He's writing to a group of Jews who have heard the gospel, are considering the gospel, and being pressured not to embrace Jesus, to not to believe, but to stay with their Jewish roots. Remember that the letter to the Hebrews was written before AD 70, and so the temple was still standing. Even though those sacrifices had become meaningless, they were still being practiced. And these people who had lived all of their life under the law of Moses are now coming to the realization or are now being told that that old covenant is obsolete, that it's been done away with, that the law of Moses is obsolete, that it's gone, that it's no longer in effect, but now there's a new covenant. And that new covenant has made the old covenant obsolete. And so when the writer of Hebrews says there remains a rest for the people of God and that his readers should strive to enter that rest, he's using the phrase the people of God to refer to Israel because historically they were the people of God. Remember that in Old Covenant Israel, all you had to do to be part of the people of God was be born into it. You just had to be born. If you were male, you were circumcised eight days later, but you had nothing to do with that decision. You are a part of the people of God by birth. This is why the idea of a new birth has such impact to people like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, when Jesus said, if you want to enter into the kingdom, you need to be born again. Why would he say that? Because his first birth didn't take. It wasn't enough. 
It made Nicodemus and the other Israelites a physical part of the physical people of God, but it did nothing for them spiritually. Because spiritually, when we become part of the people of God, it's through belief, it's through personal faith. But under the old covenant, being a part of the people of God simply meant you were physically born into it. And so when the writer of Hebrews is telling the people that he's writing to that there remains a rest for the people of God, he's saying there remains a rest for those Jews who were still practicing the old covenant, and they could enter into that rest by belief, which is what he said in chapter 4, verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest. And when we enter that rest, nothing can undo that rest. And when we enter that rest, we're there permanently. Now, things get in the way. Things can clutter that up, and we can forget or become unaware or just never be told in the first place that we are at rest, that we have peace with God in Romans 5 because of faith, because of belief, not because of what we did, not because of the family we were born into or the heritage that we have, but through believing. And that makes us, by definition, a people at rest. Well, what happens to us so often is we're told that we're not enough. We're told that we're not really at rest. We may not use those terms. We may use terms like convenience, which I alluded to a minute ago, and we might hear the message that, well, you're just seeking a convenient way out. And then something like that can quickly become a tool for false guilt in order to get you back to conformity, conformity to the rules, conformity to what the religious leaders decide you need to be, you need to be doing. I guess my point is this, that the cross took care of all of that. The cross brought us into a relationship with God through faith. Simply by believing, we've come into a relationship with the Father through faith that can never be broken. And it is part of our identity that we are now at rest. It isn't that there remains a rest for you and I that we have to strive to enter into. We're already there. We're already there by belief. We're already there by faith. The struggle now is to remind ourselves that we're there by faith. That was the cross. That was part of the work of the cross. And when you believed, you were instantly brought into rest. You were instantly brought into a peaceful relationship with God. You have peace with God. He's not upset at you. He's not mad at you. He's not disappointed in you. He loves you and he accepts you just as you are. In fact, being told that we're under obligation for some kind of religious work in order to keep God's favor is another gospel. What made you whole and what made me whole is believing. And that's enough. That's enough because that's all that there is. The gospel is simultaneously simple and profound. The cross is simultaneously simple and profound because God made it simple for us even though Jesus' work on the cross on our behalf is extremely profound. That instrument of the cross, which was a form of brutal death and suffering, is one of the deepest truths in Scripture, and yet it has been made so simple for us because it boils down to one thing. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be at rest. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you'll have everything you need for life and godliness in this present age. But that's not enough. A lot of times that's just not enough. If we're going to keep some kind of an institutional religious setting alive, we have to do more than that. But what if community is just community? What if it's spending time with other people without that obligation looming over us to always do more, to always be here at this time and be there at this time and And if we're not there at those appointed times, we feel guilty about it or there's guilt placed on us. What if it's not that difficult? What if in reality it's extremely simple because we are a people at rest? And what if we reminded one another that we are a people at rest? I think that's a picture of the ecclesia. I think that's a picture of the body of Christ. The works that God has prepared for us in advance will happen. They just won't look like we think they ought to look like if our emphasis is in the wrong place. So I just wanted to bring that topic of rest back up to you. Again, that was driven home to me again recently in in visiting an institutional church setting. And I was reminded once again that Jesus is enough, that belief is enough, that rest or being a person at rest is part of my identity in Jesus. It's not something I do or don't do. It accompanied salvation 
when I believed. And because I believed, and because you've believed, we have entered into that rest. So that's all I have for you in this episode. There's more on the way. So we'll talk again soon. Bye. Thank you for joining us on the On Sunday Show. To be a part of this ongoing conversation, visit us online at unsunday.com. Thank you.